Welcome everyone. Welcome to today's Global Dairy Farmers webinar, Indoor Controlled Feed Production, the Future of Sustainable Dairy. My name is Yvonne Osseforth. I'm the Operational Manager of Global Dairy Farmers and today I will be your host. Um, as I said before, I see already a lot of people dropping in from different countries. Uh, from Bangladesh, I saw someone from Saudi Arabia, Denmark, um, even New Zealand. It's uh, fantastic. And um, what I would like to do today, um, and this webinar is going to take approximately one hour, depending on the number of questions uh, that are being asked and the type of questions, of course. So before we officially start, this webinar and for those who are not really familiar with this um, webinar tool let me just explain how some functionalities work as well as today's outline of the webinar so oh, here we go. so some of the housekeeping so first of all this webinar is being recorded and that means that within 24 hours you will receive this webinar uh, a link in your inbox and regarding the functionalities so here at the bottom you see three functionalities chat raise hand and q a so we're only going to use raise hand and q a and raise hand you just click on this button, on this button. And that's how you do it. And then you can lower your hand again. So I have a, a practice question for all of you. So who of you is looking forward to this webinar as well as celebrating this Monday uh, World Milk Day? So let's raise your hand. That's fantastic. So a lot of people uh, are looking forward to it. Great. And I think uh, this, the next functionality, the Q&A, which is over there, you just click on it. You can type your question. You can do it anonymously if you want by ticking the box. Uh, you write your question, push send, and there's your answer. Uh, what we're going to do today, um, the presentation, the main presentation is divided in a couple of blocks and after each presentation uh, we will try to uh, answer as many questions as possible. In case that some questions are, are not answered, we're going to make sure that after the webinar is finished, there will be a document with the questions and the answers from today's presenters, Brandon Peterson and John De Jong. Um, and you will receive it within 20, within a week, Approximately, approximately a week after the webinar is finished. So today's outline, the official welcome by our president, Mr. Ab van Velde, he's a proud dairy farmer from the Netherlands. Then we have the main presentation from Brandon Peterson and John De Jong. After that, there's the panel discussion and then there's the closure. So I would now like to give the word to our president, Mr. Ab van Velde. Yeah. And he will tell you something about global dairy farmers. From my side too, uh, a welcome to every participant to this global dairy farmers webinar about a new way of feeding dairy cows. My name is Ab van Velde dairy farmer in the Netherlands and president of Global Dairy Farmers. For some of you who are not that familiar with Global Dairy Farmers, GDF is the only unique network in the world of real practicing dairy farmers. With all the online meetings, we organized the last couple of months with GDF farmers and with GDF partners, I realized what a great group GDF is, and especially for me as a dairy farmer. It's a challenging period for dairy farmers right now. Corona, corona crisis, do we get the next dry and hot summer in Europe? Situation in the US, 
about milk, about meat, milk prices, all kinds of national regulations, sustainability, sustainability topics, and many, many more. At our, at our last webinar, Mels Boer from Hoogweg International gave his opinion about the future dairy market. It looks like now that the international dairy markets, after the deep dive a few months ago, making a remarkable recovery now. Today, we have a very interesting topic, indoor, indoor controlled feed production. Regarding this webinar, first of all, I think of the dry regions in the world where they produce milk. A couple of years ago, I visited Mr. Abdulaziz Alateki in Kuwait. He is a GDF farmer who milks about 600 cows south of Kuwait City. This initiative we will speak about today might be a great improvement for Abdulaziz and maybe for his colleagues in the Middle East. And we talk about my case at our farm it could be a possible replacement of a part of the concentrate we always buy. But you also th think about the much more efficient use of water and nutrients. And of course, I'm always curious about the cost and the, invest and the investment. I'm a true farmer after all. This initiative can be a new dimension in feeding dairy cows. Brennan Peterson, Business Development Hydrogen Global Technologies, and John de Jonge, President of Hydrogen Nutrition Technology, will enter us in a new world of producing feed. And by the way, John is already a member of GDF for more than 12 years. I give the word to Brennan. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Uh, it's an honor to be here today, and I uh, look forward to bringing you um, one possible uh, one possible idea in uh, what feed production might look like here in the future. So, I, th this is going to be one concept, or one, like I said, one possible uh, idea that might happen here in the future. A good friend of mine likes to say, so what's the other right answer? So there's gonna be, the truth is there's gonna be more than one answer of what the future look like, looks like. But if we go back just 10, 20 years and think about your business for a minute, it looks a lot different today than it did 10 or 20 years ago. And some of you, if you knew what the past, if you knew what the future was in the past, it would have scared you. And I think the idea that we don't have all the answers today, but we want to strive toward better answers for the future is kind of where we want to go together. So just to kind of set the stage, we're going to talk about some of the current challenges really briefly because I, everyone's going to really relate to these and, and understand what I'm talking about, I feel. Um, some of the current challenges with traditional feed production, obviously drought, little to no moisture, um, snow, ice, winter, a lot of the parts of the world can only get one crop per year because of winter. The strange thing is the parts of the world that, that can get two crops or grow, grow feed year round often struggle with water. They don't have enough water, they don't have access to the water, or the water isn't clean or, or, or usable. Rain is an issue putting up high quality feed with spoilage, floods, hail, uh, and then water rights. Where we're at today, a lot of the parts of the world are getting more ham hampered with uh, regulations and restrictions put on by our lawmakers, our legislators, and really a lot of them are driven by the consumer. It used to be enough to produce a great product. And, and as farmers, as dairy producers, we did that. We produced a high quality product that the consumer liked. But today's consumer and the consumer of the future is gonna want a great product and a great story. And that's where sustainability comes in animal welfare, um, the issue of GMOs, 
what is this all going to look like in the future and, and how does this correlate to what we're doing today? Now, really briefly, we're going to talk about genetics just for a minute here. I probably have uh, as much background in genetics, at least in beef cattle, as I do uh, in nutrition. If you look at this graph, it shows the increase of milk production over the last 10 years in the United States. Well, the neat thing is it doesn't matter if you use, use a, a graph from the UK or almost any other country. That curve is almost identical to what the United States has seen. We're producing more milk today than we were 10 years ago. To think that that curve is just going to suddenly flatten out or decrease, I think, is a little bit foolish. If you look at what technology has done, in 2008, the first 50K SNP chip was released. Uh, that blue line shows you what, what the genetic trend for milk production has done since then. It was flat to a slight increase, and now it has tilted up on its axis and is improving rapidly. So what does that mean? The nutrition that our cows need, what we're feeding them today, is much different than what we fed them 20 or 30 years ago. To think that that won't continue on to the future, I think is a little bit foolish on our part. In the United States, uh, we used to balance rations for about 16 to 16 and a half percent uh, total dietary protein. Now we're, bash now we're balancing for about 18 percent protein. So where is this protein going to come from? If soybean meal is eliminated from some diets because of GMO restrictions, possibly dry distillers, some of the feeds that a lot of the world has access to is becoming limited. Where do we get this protein to meet the genetic needs? Um, and, and these gains weren't just genetic. There's also management uh, facilities, a lot that goes into that. But the point is we're going to continue to increase and not decrease. So with all that being said, I have a short four minute video I'd like to show you guys. Uh, we've practiced this a few times. The sound comes through pretty well. The video doesn't always, depending upon your download speeds. Yvonne will, will uh, provide this for everyone later, a link where you can download and watch it live through the link. So it's about four minutes. So welcome to the Eco Dairy Hydro Green Grow Room. My name is John DeYoung. I'm a partner at the Eco Dairy and also the president of Hydro Green. Let me take you on a small tour here of our grow room. In this grow room, we have two six section machines, which are here to grow six day old wheatgrass, which we feed to our dairy cows. And also we have a grass fed beef program here at the Eco Day. What we have here is six different layers, one for each day of growing. It goes from one pound of seed to five pounds of feed in six days. So here at the end of the machine, we have our very simple land on a stand control panel. Very, very simple touch screen which controls the harvesting, but also the watering. We can adjust any of the protocols of the machine right here from this panel. And this is integrated into the PLC back at our head office, where we can help the farmers really manage their facility. They simply are a conveyor belt, as you can see along here, with a roller and a drive mechanism. We use water controls, lighting controls, and a simple conveyor. When the product is grown after six days, we activate this motor, the material winds up on a roller, and it drops on the table when it goes through the cutters. Once the system is now then harvested, the belt is cleaned automatically and returned and it automatically seeds. That's how simple the system works. And as farmers, and users, this is what we like about the hydrogen system. We're able to take 15 pounds of dry matter into the sophisticated dairy ration, and we're really learning what that can do to the rumen of the animals. So advanced feed technology is a real new component of feeding this controlled environment animal feed to ruminant animals, being beef and dairy. One of the benefits that we saw already three years ago when we started feeding this hydrogen product to our beef and dairy animals was the health benefits to these animals. 
And what we found is no matter where you are on earth, you can feed fresh, green, lush, nutritious products to these animals 365 days of the year. My name is Bill Vanderkoy. I'm the farmer at the Bakerview Eco Dairy here in Abbotsford, BC. Uh, this farm is used for both uh, producing milk as well as for agritourism, where we teach people where their food comes from. Um, as you can see in this ration, it's a total mix ration, and we've incorporated hydrogen into the mixture. Um, we're also currently doing a trial where we're replacing some grain in the diet with hydrogen, as well as some forage in the diet with hydrogen. And then in between that, we've got a control diet so we can measure differences in performance, production, and health. So far at the early stage of the trial, we're seeing some positive benefits on performance. So here at the Bakerview farm, uh, we're raising uh, grass finished beef, they're Angus Holstein crosses, and we're using the hydrogen as part of the finishing diet. So in this PMR, we have grass silage and hydrogen, and we're finishing these cattle. Uh, they're all steers, and they're finishing grading at AAA, which is really impressive. And we can do this year round because we're using hydrogen as part of this diet. So there you have that. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed that and, and were able to hear it. We're going to talk just for a few minutes about fodder, and then we're going to hopefully bring it all together and, and see how it might fit into the dairy of the future. So fodder itself is not a new idea. It's actually been around since about the 1600s. We find records in writings and pictures and other things, uh, at least at that time point. Currently, there's about 25 dairies in the state of Utah alone that, that I know of that are feeding fodder or have fed fodder recently. The dairies themselves, they love the feed. They talk about the energy and the health that it gives the cows, but they hate the labor because it's a labor intense trade system if you guys have ever seen uh, fodder production. It used to be a one size fits all approach. It was typically sold in the past as a silver bullet. Someone would come on your farm and you would give them some money and they would give you a system and say, feed as much as you want, feed all that you can of this. This is the best ingredient ever. We've, we've kind of refined that. Uh, the idea is that fodder is a great ingredient. It's a great feed, but it's just that, it's an ingredient. It's one part of a successfully well-balanced diet. So what we're using is state-of-the-art technology. It's an automated system that basically harvests and seeds with the push of just one button. It's simple to operate as you saw in the video. Uh, it's a touchscreen computer that basically with one button will start the seeding and harvest process. There's no additional harvest equipment needed. It's going to produce live fresh feed every single day with really no special seed, feed storage. You'll push the button, the feed's going to fall onto the conveyor, come out of the building and, and go into either a bunker or right into your feed wagon. The neat thing about that is it eliminates almost all of your shrink, waste, or spoilage. Uh, there's no preservatives needed. It's, it's all natural from that standpoint. It's take, we're using water, seed, and light to grow this feed to about eight inches tall in just six days. It's a one-person operation with limited labor required, and there's very few moving parts. If you watch the video, there's a belt, and it seeds off at one end, and it seeds back with the other end, but then that belt sits still for about six days until the fodder is done growing. So what about the nutrition? The quality of the nutrition is really what you guys all want to hear about. The feed is about 95% digestible. So if my fist is a seed, the original parent seed is about 60 to 62 to 65% digestible. In those six days of growing, we're gonna end up with a plant that's about 95% digestible. It's full of natural enzymes that's gonna aid in the overall digestion of the ration. So here's my seed again. This, when you water this seed, the hydrolytic enzymes are gonna to go to work and start digesting the starches as that seed grows into, into grass. Those same hydrolytic enzymes that digested that seed, converted the starch into sugars, are still active at day six. So when it goes from the diet and the cattle consume this feed, those same hydrolytic enzymes are gonna go in the rumen and, and be effective in the rumen on not just the forage or the fodder, but upon the whole rations the cattle ate that day. So you're gonna have a, an increase in the digestive efficiencies. The feed itself is high in energy, 
it's high in protein, and it's high in phosphorus. So if you look at your most expensive macronutrients that you're gonna have in a diet, it's energy, protein, and phosphorus. The neat thing about fodder itself, it's high in all three of those. The germination process is gonna naturally chelate the minerals. We recommend about 20 to 25% of the ration dry matter come from hydrogen or come from fodder. So nutrient delivery, what is it? So we're gonna talk, try to talk fairly specific, but know that this is all within a range. Typically, if you use wheat as your parent seed, and most people will use wheat or barley, in some parts of the year, world they might use corn, um, but almost any seed we can grow and grow effectively. Typically on wheat, we see an 18 to 18.5% 18 protein feed, about an 85 NEL or net energy for lactation, it's going to be 30 to 32 percent sugar, 0.42 percent phosphorus, 20 percent NDF, and it's going to be about 23 percent dry matter or a little bit better when you're using wheat. Uh, if you use barley, it's going to be a little bit lower than that. Each, each seed type is going to have its own dry matter that you're going to get from that seed, but the neat thing is now we can start blending those seeds and really tailoring the nutrition that you grow on your table for what you need. So for the dairy, it's absolutely a great fit. Like I said, fodder's an important ingredient in a well-balanced diet. There's almost no waste and no shrink. And each and every day, it's feed on demand, nutrition on demand, basically with just a push of a button. It's a high moisture product, so it's a great ration conditioner, knocking down dust, helping with ration mixability, creating a really nice TMR for you guys to feed your cows. It's a high quality and consistent nutrition on demand. So in summary, we're going seed to feed in six days. The process that we're using is, is na a natural process, germination, to convert starch to sugars. We're going from a grain to a highly digestible forage, like I said, in just six days. This changes the digestibility from 65 to about 95%. We're increasing the protein from two and a half. We're getting a protein increase of about two and a half to 3%. It's gonna depend on your seed. So if you have a low protein seed, maybe it's only a 12% protein seed to start with with a parent seed before you water it, it's gonna go up to about 14 or 14 and a half percent. And if you're starting with a nice 16% uh, protein seed, you'll probably end up somewhere between 18 and a half and 19%. You're gonna have an almost identical in energy profile as the parent seed had. You're just gonna convert that starch into sugars. So the neat thing about that, that's, that's really where a lot of this, the digestibility is a great thing, and this part here. You're reducing metabolic stress by lowering the starch load on the animals. So when you can feed fodder and start replacing some grains and some forage, but replacing some grains, you're lowering the overall starch load. That's where we're starting to see some of the health improvements in these animals. So we're going to take a quick break for, for questions here. Uh, I assume Yvonne's going to take over and do that. Yes, exactly. Um, so we've got a couple of questions already. And uh, I see a question from Moa Budazad from Bangladesh. Basically, I will read out the question. In the context of Bangladesh green grass production in indoor system or hydrophonic system, it's very new innovation. Um, per kilo costing is almost double of conventional system. How can it be minimized? So let me see, I'm not sure if I understand the question completely, but the, uh, the minimizing the cost is gonna come one from your labor savings, you're gonna have a water savings, you'll have a space savings when you, when you look at your land, and then just that upgrade of your nutrition, that digestibility change, um, the feed that you produce is going to be uh, more readily available and uh, of more value in your ration than the original seed or possibly something else you could do with that land. I, I'm hoping and thinking a couple of my slides I have coming up will help maybe dive a little deeper into that question for him. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Brendan. I hope uh, that answered the question. And you have a couple of more questions. Um, from your point of view, do you see it more as, uh, a question from Alphonse, do you see it more as roughage 
profits or as a concentrant or something in between? Unfortunately, it's probably something in between for lack of a great answer because there's no lignin in it. Uh, when we do our NDF and uh, ADF digestible fiber studies, we're getting something that is, that is acting very much like a corn silage. It's definitely no longer a grain. So we're taking that starch out and converting it to sugars, like I said. Uh, you don't have any lignin, so it's very digestible, but you still are gonna need, if you just fed fodder, you'd be, you'd be low on, you're gonna need some more fiber, digestible fiber in that ration. Um, so it's gonna act more like a forage or a roughage in there, but you're still gonna have the need for um, some digestible fiber in there in addition. Thank you, thank you, very clear. Um, let's do two more questions. One question from Erwin. So which protocol is used to reduce the risk of mold? So, so there's, uh, there's three or four ways we use with our system, with the controlled environment ag production here, to reduce mold. One would be uh, a food grade hydrogen peroxide is a, is a really good way to reduce mold. Some of our customers use that. Some of our customers don't use anything but water, uh, seed, and light. The best thing is getting your environment right, controlling your temperature and controlling your humidity by having a sophisticated system there that can properly give you a good environment. You can do a really good job controlling mold. And then the third or fourth thing, depending on how you take my answer, uh, would be the seed cleaner. A proper seed cleaner uh, for fodder production will help you pull some of those mold particles and those spores off of the seed, giving you a cleaner, better seed to start your germination with. Thank you, thank you. Okay, so the last question for now um, from Akmal. The minerals, how will it be insured? How will it be insured? I'm not sure if I am. That they are uh, there, the levels of uh, the oh. minerals. Yep, we do. We've done a lot of lab testing within that. Um, just the basic study of germination will show you the natural chelation of minerals at a young age. Um, there's a there's a lot more research or study that's been done on the germination process than there is on actual fodder itself. So you can that part we can look up and and have a lot of really nice reference materials for that. Thank you. I think that's the last question for now. All right, perfect. Well, thank you guys. Um, talk just briefly. So some of the things that our customers are telling us. So like I said, this is, this is what we are working on. The testing and proving phase is really where we're, we're at now. As, as we grow and build these, the things that we hear back from our customers are higher pregnancy rates, uh, lower dry matter intakes, increased feed efficiencies, increased milk production, improved herd health, improved fats. This is where we're at today. We're in the process of building a facility for 800 cows or to feed 800 cows, I should say. This facility here is the, is the drawing or the blueprint for this. Um, the drawing you see has 18 systems in it. We're gonna put 14 systems in it to start with and have room to expand from there. The system, when you put 14 systems in the building, you'll produce about 6,700 pounds a day or 30,000 kilograms of feed on an as-fed basis. It'll produce 15,000 pounds of dry matter, about 7,000 kilograms of dry matter every single day. This dry matter would replace about 300 acres or 121 hectares of corn silage. That's on a, just on a dry matter pound to a dry matter pound. So if you have a pound of dry matter from corn silage, and a pound of dry matter from, from fodder or hydrogreen, you're gonna re replace about 121 hectares. Now the neat thing is we're gonna have a, we're gonna have more energy than the corn silage, and we're gonna have about twice of the overall protein as the corn silage. So pound for pound, you're replacing 121 hectares, but from a nutritional standpoint, you're replacing a lot more in the diet. This project is about 234 feet long, 80 feet wide, or 71 meters long and 24 meters wide. It's 18,000 square feet, um, which comes to about 1,730 square meters. 
Like I said, it compares 300 acres or 121 hectares to about 1,700 square meters. So sustainability, kind of wrap this up here. We're gonna tie it all back to what we started talking about. How do we meet the expectations placed on us? Like I said, if you remember your operation in 2010 and where you are today in 2020, think about where you might go in 2030. In these next 10 years, where you wanna take your business and what expectations will be placed on us by the consumer. So where have we been, where are we going? The nice thing about fodder production is we can point to a really nice reduce in, re, reduction in feed miles. We're not burning the diesel fuel to harvest or store the feed. We can very easily be non-GMO, organic, um, grass-fed, hits it really well. And we have a huge water saving over traditional crops. So we look at gallons of water, and I, and, I, and I apologize I didn't get this converted for you guys, but the graph it's, itself is going to be the same. So gallons of water to produce one pound of dry matter. If you look at, currently look at alfalfa production, it's going to take about 45 gallons of water to produce just one pound of dry matter from using alfalfa as your crop. Corn silage, it's going to take about 26 or 27 pounds of corn of water to produce one pound of corn silage on a dry matter basis. When we go inside and use vertical farming to do this, we can use about 1.3 gallons of water to produce one pound of dry matter. It's about 30 times more efficient to grow hydrogreen or fodder compared to alfalfa, just from a water usage standpoint. So hydrogreen is putting you in control of your feed, your farm, and your future. So I've got time for just a couple of questions and I'm gonna uh, turn this over to Mr. John DeYoung here, Yvonne. Thank you, Brandon. So we have a couple of more questions. Um, let me see. So a question I get, we get quite often is um, regarding the size of your dairy farm. So here Ahab is asking uh, if it's fit for mega dairy farms um, for 500 dairy cow or bigger? And a similar question, is it useful in small holding systems in India? So yeah, uh, the nice thing about our system, it's scalable from one system to a thousand or, or whatever you want to do. Uh, on, the, on the big side, I think John's gonna do a very good job addressing that. Um, one system will produce about up to 3,500 pounds a day of feed on an as-fed basis. So somewhere around 60 to 80 cows, depending upon how many um, heifers and, and dry cows and stuff like that they're trying to feed in addition to it. So it works pretty well for most small farms all the way up to uh, what John is gonna show you in a few minutes. Thank you. I see another question that's being asked quite regularly and it can be um, summarized in this one. Can you share a bit more on cost of production per kilo dry matter? Yeah, I, you know, I can. Um, I think that's probably best addressed on each individual one-on-one -on -one basis because there's so many variables that go into this. Um, everything from seed cost to land to water and each part of the world is so unique. So I think I do it a real disservice to try to to generalize, to make a general statement right now. I apologize for the, my poor answer, I guess. Well, thank you for your answer. Um, maybe people afterwards will uh, can send you an email um, for more detailed information. Um, and yeah, knowing the details they have. Uh, a question from Bernard, from an operational side, what is needed to change from a management and people skills side? So you need, you need somebody that wants to, that wakes up every day and wants to grow feed. If you have someone that just wants to come in and push a button, you're gonna be on the low end of production. And it doesn't matter if you use our system, um, a tray system that's out there. You, wanna, you want someone that's gonna pay attention to your water schedules. They're not tricky, um, they're not hard to do, but it takes you that first month or two to really fine tune that and really understand the art of doing that. 
our best producers wake up each day. Um, they want to grow feed. They want to do a better job for themselves. The nice thing is, uh, even up to the scale that uh, that John's going to show us, it's for the most part a one man operation. So if you get that right person that's willing to take ownership of this, uh, it can be extremely successful. Thank you, Brandon. Then I think we're going to do one more question uh, from Alok. Can we distribute it to other farmers uh, around, as in how long uh, will it last to be fresh? Yep. So we, we currently have several people that are in process of doing that on some level, either in the designing phase or the phase of actually doing that, whether it be through a TMR center um, or it's a neighbor selling to another neighbor, that you can do that. So the you, in really hot weather, you're probably 24 hours or just a little bit more, but you really need to keep it shaded, you know, because it will mold and it will spoil over time because it is a wet feed. But as soon as you mix it in a ration, it's a lot more stable than just if you set it in a pile in the sun. Uh, as with any feed, any wet feed, that would probably be the worst thing you could do with it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brendan, and thank you. Uh, for providing all this information so far. Um, I think, yeah, you already clicked on the slide. I think it's time for uh, John now to present. Yep, I, I will, uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. John DeYoung. He's our next, present, our next presenter. Um, he's the chief design officer at Cubic Farms, the owner of Artex Barns, and he's the president of Hydrogen Global. And like we said at the beginning, a member of Global Dairy Farmers since 2008. Did that work, Yvonne? Yep. Excellent, excellent. So uh, yeah, thank you for the introduction and it's a real honor to be here. And uh, as I said to Ad yesterday in our sort of gathering is it is uh, a Global Dairy Farmers has been a very, very, very special group to me. I've been able to host Global Dairy Farmers Group to China twice, first 2009 and then 2019. And um, I've traveled to many, many different countries and I've been blessed with a huge education and a massive network growth. So thank you to all the members for allowing our participation over the years. It's been a real good journey. Um, I know a lot of you uh, in this group and um, I'm on a dairy farm in the Midwest. For those of you that can recognize the background, I'll leave it at that, but I am not to disclose where I am, um, but also blessed with um, innovative thinkings. And through my last 20 years in business, um, I have been stretched and uh, educated and trained and made a lot of mistakes and, and uh, had to redo a lot of things. But one of the things that has really fascinated me is technology integration into the dairy industry, whatever that may be. Um, I also might mention we are partners in several uh, De Laval dealerships and that was from per per Francisco who's joined us in this, in this seminar as well. Uh, we work closely with Lely as well in certain regions. We, we work in the dairy, developing dairy industry and are very, very proud of that. And I'm proud of the dairy industry for recognizing the, the importance of the integration of technology. And we as an industry, I'm gonna say very carefully, we might, if you compare it to pigs and poultry, might be laggers a little bit on integration of technologies, but the technologies haven't been advanced enough. And it was mentioned earlier is, can we afford this technology? Can it make us money? We are in a tough financial situation and we can't invest if it's not gonna help us become more profitable and then ultimately sustainable. So those questions are always in the forefront of our thoughts. I'm, I'm, can everyone see the, fo the photo that's labeled a little bit on the background? Yvonne, that's okay. Good. So um, there's two projects that we're working on in particular that I wanted to bring. So what this project that uh, you'll see here is a project that we are developing in partnership uh, in Eastern Europe. I'm gonna just leave it at that. And we are doing a similar project like this in the Midwest um, with different, different groups of people. But I wanted to just walk through what we believe how 
some developing technologies could be part of our future. So you can see on the very bottom, a milk processing plant. Well, we all have our own thoughts and feelings about vertical integration, dairy farmers owning processing plants. There's lots of history. I don't need to talk about that, but the question is, are dairy farmers going to own their own processing plants in the future? I'm not an expert in that field and you can draw your own conclusions. In these particular cases, that is the consideration. Inside the milking barn, you'll see to the left of it, you'll see uh, first of all farm offices, which we need to have. And on the far left in that particular building will be two 100 stall rotaries. And then we'll be able to have two freestall barns and we've split them up in rather than putting them in one large facility like we're doing in the US. Uh, just so everyone can be aware, in the US right now, Artex, our company in partnership uh, with many others, uh, we're doing one project in Idaho, which will be 46,000 cows. We're doing one project in Texas right now, which will be 24,000 cows. We're doing three in the Midwest, all over 10,000 cows. So the 10,000 cow model has somewhat replaced, if you will, the 3000 cal model, which was developed in the Midwest by Californians many, many years ago, 20 years ago. And with technology and, and efficiencies and our ability to manage these facilities has developed quite nicely over the years. And now a 10,000 cal freestyle barn is not a real big challenge, depending where you are, to be respectful of different people in different countries. But I wanted to just walk through some of the very intriguing technologies. You'll see on this particular farm, there's no manure lagoon. And if there's dairymen on this call and said that there's potentially technology that are on the verge of entering into the dairy industry that would take your waste stream, process it live, and be able to put the product into a 333 fertilizer, so it's nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium into a 333 product. If we were able to capture the methane gas, burn the methane gas to produce energy to chill, to ch transfer into glycol to cool these facilities, what would that mean for us? And so we, we won't be able to answer all the questions today, nor is it the intent but we've been building big, big cross vent barns for many years. And we, have, we sell millions of dollars of fans every year. And there's high pressure fogging and there's soakers and there's all these technologies. But frankly, we are at our limit of able to cool cows in certain climates. When we go to the Middle East, when we go to even here in the Midwest, when you get temperatures of 33, 34 degrees and you get 80, 90% humidity, it is virtually impossible to give the cow the right environment. So I am super, super um, intrigued by some of the developing technologies. We're working with some of the world leading greenhouse energy people, energy conversion people, and it's an honor to work with them. Also, there's several technologies in different countries on the manure processing side. It's not new, but it is a new technology uh, this particular technology is again using the gases to dry down the bedding and you'll get an incredibly dry bedding material to go back into the freestyle barns. And then because this is a hydro green presentation, you'll also see in the very back sustainability, the net zero. So the, the whole plan of this particular site is that it would be net zero carbon footprint. Um, we've also been blessed to work with many of the large food producers, and I won't name them. You, you, for those of you that know me, you'll know there is a large global need, uh, demand from consumers, from government, um, and we talk in particular about the, the agricultural landscape, even in Europe. What does it look like in 10 years? Well, I can say this, I believe confidently, it will not mean more cows, it might mean less cows. It might mean that there's gonna be more trees planted and more walkways for the humans. But what does that mean for us in agriculture? We need to be very cognizant of our carbon footprint. The hydrogreen system on this dairy, you'll see just one building proposed. The proposal in the, in the European model is that we are gonna put one building up, which will feed, it's very similar to the drawing that Brandon was talking about, the, the project we're doing in Canada, to feed between 800 and 1,000 cows to start with, to prove the theories. For those of you that know me, the last thing I wanna do is take money from somebody and not have theories proven. So we are 
really striving to add value to make certain that every dollar is set is spent gives you a return so that's to answer the question earlier about typically these production is twice the price how can we make that relevant on our farm the integration of these technologies i think work very closely together and i think many of these are needed for us to be able to really be sustainable in large scale production and I also understand that not everyone on this call is large scale production. So we, we will be happy to engage with you to talk about smaller scale production. So for example, um, I am a partner in the Eco Dairy as you saw uh, on the introduction of the video walk around that I did. And we've been owners of Hydro Green now for three and a half years. And our little dairy farm has one robot. We milk 44 cows. We have young animals. We are producing 45 or 46 liters, incredible animal health, and we've been feeding the Hydro Green to these girls for three and a half years. And as Bill said, you saw the video, we are also into grass, grass fed beef program. So it is a small farm of 40 cows. And for us, we have seen huge animal health benefits. The, 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 the comment Brandon was talking about was a report back from our dairy. We've got four to 5% increase in conception rates but we are looking to partner with universities, in many cases, different states, different countries, and also in Europe to really quantify and verify this. So because I'm a, mem a member of Global Dairy Farmers for so many years, this is the platform where we can openly discuss new merging technologies. And I am not saying this is commercially ready. I'm not saying this is the future. I'm saying that we as a group of companies are really, really focusing on how does this, how can this development of technologies and integration of technologies shape our future? And what lessons do we have to learn? How do we have public acceptance? Uh, how is it gonna tie into environmental footprints and those things? So for me, I'm very blessed to, to be here talking to you about this. Um, we spend most of our waking hours trying to really add value to the progressive dairymen, the people that wanna be part of the dairy future. Um, with our dealerships, with our Artex business, but also developing these technologies, which is why we acquired HydroGreen. We're very proud and we think this is a platform that is relevant into the future. I'm very happy to answer any questions we might have. And I don't know that we've gone over time. And if, I, if I've talked too long, I apologize. It's usually the case when I speak. <laughs> Thank you, John. Um, yeah, a question regarding, uh, we talk about sustainability, um, it's all in consumers' minds. Um, how do you make sure that uh, consumers have the same kind of perception um, of sustainability and animal welfare in, in, uh, in, in this type of farming? Make sure that you transfer this perception onto the consumers. Thank you, Yvonne. Uh, so I apologize. I missed one important topic. For, for, for those of you that look at those freestall barns, so when we take the methane gas, we convert the energy and we go into glycol transfer and we air condition these facilities with the gases, we are creating an environment that is between 12 and 14 degrees Celsius and 20 to 30 percent humidity every day of the year. So when you're in the Middle East, that might be of interest. But even when you're in the Midwest here, or even in Canada where I am, we often struggle. So giving the cow the perfect environment, also feeding the cows fresh, fresh feed every single day. Giving, so we're trying to just, and, and also bring in all these merging technologies to manage these things. And a big one, Yvonne, and, and I don't know if Lawrence Schilderlink is on the call. Lawrence Schilderlink is a very dear friend and a longtime customer. He, he is a uh, Dutch dairy farmer, moved to Denmark, who came to the U.S. in the early 2000s, who actually introduced me to global dairy farmers, and I'm forever in debt to him. But we've been talking about this sustainability play for years, is that we need to speak to our consumers and also in the future, what, what value does the milk as a commodity play? So talking about uniqueness of markets and different products that we develop, but also when we can sit here and talk about our environmental impact. So we believe that the environmental impact story in conjunction of all these other things I've been talking about is the story that our industry maybe 
needs or would like so it can be relevant into the future. Another one I wanna also add is when you look at the next generation coming in and you look at the young children, my kids in particular, and, and those that are on this call, this makes farming exciting again. It makes it, it makes it sexy. It makes it innovative. It endorses technologies. And these are things we also need to attract the next generation of people that are gonna run these farms. So, and again, being very closely with some of the milking companies uh, that I mentioned earlier, I've been very proud to be able to work with them and they've been challenging us and back and forth. And it's clear, we have to reinvent ourselves and really, really, really make an impact. And I, I believe that to be part of our futures, integrating all of these things. Thank you, John. Very, very clear. Um, and I think actually uh, a question that's also being asked um, might uh, yeah, connect to this question. So um, it's more, the question is, did you observe um, raised immune system in animal as, as a side effect, which could help, you know, about um, telling the story about animal welfare? I'll, I'll tell you a cute little story. So there in, in, in Western Canada, where I live, and just outside of Vancouver, our little farm, we've been feeding hydro green for three years. And then also the largest dairy farm in Canada are good friends of ours, just 20 kilometers away from us. And they chose uh, another technology, which is a rack system. And they were feeding about 100 cows. They milk about 6,000 cows in Canada. They're a very, very large producer, but they're looking for new innovative technologies. And where I live, land is $120,000 an acre. So what's that? $300,000 a hectare. So very, very expensive. So they're looking for innovative ways. So they started feeding one group of, I think it was 96 cows, this manual rack and stack system, but it's the same plant. Uh, so they, they started to really see energy changes of cows. They start also saw conception rates, reduction of medicines, these types of things. But one of the challenges was funny because they have about 15 or 16 dairy farms in the region. And so this farm milked about uh, 400 cows and one pen of 96 was getting this feed. And after about six months of feeding, they saw different animal behavior, more activity, more energy, um, amazing performance as Brennan indicated. But what happened was, is because of the conception rate improvements, what the, what the other farms started doing, because they were all under the same ownership, they started bringing all the sick cows and all the cows that were bred five, six, seven, eight times, they brought them to this pen of 96 cows. So we actually lost the ability to test this. So I have to be honest with everybody. There is an honest belief that needs to be verified. And back to the earlier caller's question is it needs to be validated before this story can really make it into the marketplace. But because our global dairy farmers group are innovators and we're always trying to stretch each other, which is why we chose to bring this. So this project in Eastern Europe has decided to endorse these technologies and, then, and in fact, the, the project that we're doing in Western Canada is the top veterinarian who's my cousin. So we helped build a dairy farm for them five years ago, and we've developed a lot of technologies, and we're getting some grants from the Canadian government. There's some things that we're doing, but the main purpose is, is to validate and verify. We have to prove this. And I will say to all everyone listening, we have to be able to repeat this. We have to have excellent sources of seed. Our, our processes, our protocols must be completely predictable or this is too risky of an investment. And I say that with all due respect, but that's what I truly believe. Thank you. And I think there's a room for one more question that actually uh, fits nicely to what just has been asked. It's a question from Gavin. Do you see the consumer paying more, a premium for this quality milk or beef, or is this simply a must do in order to sell our product? <laughs> That's an amazing question. And I just left a group meeting that we have 22 people who kind of the gathering of the minds here in the Midwest. And that is a question that came up. The reality is we have to produce at the same price or less because price is the driver in our industry. And we believe when we, when we get these technologies like super efficient. So if you look at our equipment, we, will, we believe we can produce 20%. So let's say um, 
about 25%, I guess, of the feed for this dairy farm with one or two people. So there is a capital cost. So we talked to companies like Land Lakes, Cargill, there's other companies that are in the seed business. So maybe this, this, expensive, is, this expensive investment may not be on the farmer's balance sheet. It might be five kilometers or five miles away. The capital is owned by a hedge fund and you buy feed by the ton. You know, of course, kind of how it's done in Israel with feed centers and such. So I think partnerships, investment of capital, all these things, like even the milk processing plant, well, there's a lot of funds and a lot of capital that might come in here with a solid business plan. So the day of the family farm in many cases is being sort of stressed and challenged and other people are looking to invest and partner with us because when we are producing quality feed, we know it's needed, we know it needs to grow, the protein that we, we, we produce is needed in the world. The, but the, the trick is, is you're trying to partner with your consumers, your local government. You I mean, that's another one, a new partner that we have to deal with is regulatory bodies. Look what's happened in the Netherlands. Regulatory body, bodies have totally affected the economics of dairy farms. So the question I have for these regulatory bodies, if we can show a net carbon zero dairy farm, will you, the government, subsidize us to help pay for this? because you're subsidizing wastewater treatment plants, we're being a wastewater treatment plant. So, so I don't think we have the answers. All I think all I'm doing, and this is the story of my life, all I do is create more questions. I don't answer any of them, which is one of my challenges. But I am fascinated to explore these technologies. So hopefully that touches on some of the answers that they all need to work together. Because when you look at this project, it's very capital intensive and how do we get that return back? So those are some of the obvious challenges, Yvonne. Thank you, John. I think a lot more questions are being uh, raised and I think we need an, another, an extra webinar to uh, touch base on, on all of that. Um, I think it's nice to now start the panel discussion. Um, so thank you, John, for this uh, wonderful presentation so far. Um, what I'm going to do now, also for the attendees, I'm going to name uh, a couple of names. And once I've done that, I'm going to ask those people to turn on their video and their um, sound as well. So, Abdulaziz Alateki. Uh, here you go. Um, I saw Fern Brown. And uh, Jim Lear. And let me see who else, Tom Ellison. So hi there. Hello. Hello. Um, I think um, Every one of you to shortly to uh, introduce yourself. Uh, Vern, can you just uh, tell us who you are, uh, what you do, and where you're from? I live in Jonesville, Michigan. I was a lifelong dairy farmer, although I quit milking cows about 20 years ago. And I do uh, financial and, um, and project consulting for large dairy groups. I've last couple last 10 years I've been involved in exporting a lot of dairy cattle to developing economies. Thank you. Thank you, Ver. Um, Tom Allison, can you introduce yourself? I think your sound is off. Yeah, perfect. Hi, I'm Tom. Uh, I'm a Nuffield Scholar from West Wales. Um, I have a particular fetish for technology on dairy farms. Um, and so we have a, a small um, milking machine equipment business now in, in, in West Wales, and I do some uh, technical consulting. Thank you. Great to meet uh, you, Tom. Thank you, Tom. Jim? <clears throat> Hi, I am uh, the Director of Technical Marketing for Hydro Green Global, and uh, so I join Brandon and John in that you company. That was our that mistake, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I'm, in, I'm in South Dakota. Okay, thank you, Jim. Um, Abdulaziz? Hello. Uh, I'm a veterinarian and a dairy farmer in Kuwait. Thank you. I think it will welcome everyone. Um, 
I think it's maybe nice if John or Brandon uh, starts with a question for maybe one or maybe for all uh, for all of you. Brandon, do you have a question for these participants? So I think it's hard to it's hard to probably get a great question that's not really lengthy answers, but based on maybe some ideas that we hopefully challenge your thought today, how do you uh, is this of value? How do you see how do you see some of these thoughts playing in uh, to what we've showed you? I mean, I, it's a big question, but just briefly, give us a little feedback on what you see. I'll start. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I'm 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 really shocked about how far you've gone in in uh, in the commercial development of this. And I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit embarrassed. Um, I was a bit skeptical about, the, pro about the, the product because I come from the United States where we think in terms of 10,000 and 50,000 cow dairy farms. And it hadn't really occurred to me that there's an application for this in other countries like Middle Eastern countries, Pakistan, Bangladesh, where they're never gonna get to these mega farms like we're used to the projects we're designing right now. And I think it's really even more important because um, <clears throat> Uh, like it or not, with this COVID thing, we're going to see a lot more nationalism regarding food production. And um, you know. there's going to be a, a, a huge push financially from all the countries in the world to bring domestic, to, 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 to bring food production back home. Um, and so that's going to, that's going to revitalize a lot more small time dairy farms, I think, and uh, small scale dairy farms, maybe not in the United States, but in, but in other countries where they don't have them anyway, like India, you know, and um, and and uh, the other thing I'll, I'll point out was I, I don't have any doubt at all about the results you're seeing on your farm, John, because I I switched over to grass-based farming about 20 years ago, and I run a small organic uh, dairy heifer raising operation, so I'm kind of a closet greenie anyway, and you know the the advantages of fresh feed are are, are well known, so I'm quite impressed. Thank you, Vern. Um, do, do you want me to go next? Yep. Yes, please, John. Um, I, I think it's, it's, it's a really exciting uh, complement to, to, to the challenges that we are currently facing. Um, I, I argued, when I, when I did my nut build, I argued that the idea of a dairy farmer, as we as society, as society is conceptualized, has sort of started to break down now. There's a lot more influences in what's going on in the farm than just the guy that lives in the farmhouse. We, we rely on expertise from nutritionists, from geneticists, from data scientists, from electrical engineers. And so we, it, it, we can easily sort of start to imagine a, a future where perhaps some of the food production might be done just down the road instead of all in-house as we'd have in the UK. And the, the idea of hauling food from, from, from far away is becoming more and more um, difficult for us to sell to our consumers. And basically, the, the, they're the people that we have to win. They're the people we have to keep, keep happy. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you have read. There, there was a report released last year by a think tank called RethinkX. Um, and and they, they're basically predicting sort of the wholesale failure of the livestock industry um, by, by 2030. It's a really compelling read. They make some really good arguments. Um, and they, they outline uh, a technology called precision fermentation, which is, which is basically how we um, produce uh, artificial um, insulin now. Um, and so they're, they're, they're the, the core concept of, of their technology is um, is uh, food as a software so you'll be able to design a molecule uh, or protein and, and, and a system or a process behind it to ferment that that molecule uh, and that becomes our, our, our food stuff and and there's I think there's we, we have to to avoid that kind of dystopian nightmare future we, ha we have to engage it, uh, it, with new technologies and new systems and show our consumers and, and the customer why 
why they should support us. As otherwise, um, the, the, the equation or the consideration that goes through their minds will be, well, what difference is it? You know, I might as well buy from this protein tank or from this farm that I perceive there to be a lot of suffering and it to be environmentally unsustainable. So I think this is a great, great uh, potential uh, solution for a lot of those issues. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Tom. And um, Abdulaziz um, Ad actually mentioned you in the uh, in his introduction. Do you see um, you yourself or your colleagues? Colleagues? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I try to open the camera. Just give me a few minutes. Okay. <laughs> sure. Sure. Uh, so it's my turn to speak. Yeah, if you want to. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I will add something. Uh, I'm but confusing with this uh, camera, so <laughs> just I need some uh, one minute if someone didn't speak. Oh, but um, if it doesn't work, you don't have to turn on your camera. Okay. okay. Uh, rega regarding uh, this technology, I am fascinated with it. I see it for the first time uh, uh, in, uh, in, in a show in Dubai uh, from Australian company. Approximately same technology, but in a smaller scale. Uh, and I was fascinated with it, and uh, I think it will solve a lot of problems, especially the fodder. Uh, but when I came here to home and I speak with people about it, uh, the nutritionist said that um, it will not solve a solution. It will, uh, it will not solve a problem. It will create a problem because of the dry matter. He was thinking a lot about the dry matter and I am not very good in uh, animal feeding. So he told me what about the dry matter? We are feeding the, the dehydrated alpha alpha and all these things. So uh, I guarantee for him that there will not be any problem of uh, mold. So he said, I don't care. I agree that uh, there is no mold and they are using very nice technology about this, but the dry matter and uh, formulating and uh, EMR using. That's, that was his uh, feedback based on that uh, technology, Australian technology that I bring from the show. So I am very interested about this because if I can uh, uh, have solutions, I can uh, come and uh, use this technology. But as I said, the nutritionist was not happy about it. Uh, can I just speak to that? Um, so, Abdul, thank you for, is, is my sound okay? Yeah, very okay. Okay, okay. so thank you for, for that context, and I'm going to say that that is not the first time these things have been brought to our table, uh, so we really appreciate that, and those are some of the, the key things we need to address, and if you look at Jim, Jim is smiling, but these types of questions are what keep Jim up at nighttime and keep Jim employed, so he has really, really dug into what are the true benefits and how do we actually speak the language of the advisors on our farms? Because let's face it, the banker and the nutritionist are two very, very impactful people on our farms. So I don't speak nutritionist. I'm a business development guy. Jim speaks nutritionist. So maybe Jim, you can, don't take more than three minutes, Jim, to address oh, those concerns. <laughs> uh, I think I can do it in two. Uh, okay. I'm I'm a uh, been in the f livestock feeding and animal health business for over 45 years and and when I became aware of this opportunity to get involved with Hydrogreen, uh, I had to first educate myself because I was a traditional nutritionist using traditional grains and forages and didn't really have a clue about fodder and I had all the same concerns about using fodder and diets that the that the nutritionists around the world are struggling with until they learn about it. And I had to do research about fodder and it's been around a long time. As Brandon has said, we just figured out at Hydrogreen how to make it scalable and how to bring all the other benefits that we can control uh, that other production systems don't allow us to do. So the way I look at it is this, Hydrogreen again, as Brandon has said, is an ingredient that fits in a diet 
follows all the normal nutritional parameters. We still balance all of the micros and all the macros. We still balance them to meet production needs and reproduction needs and health needs of the animal we're feeding. And we're using other ingredients that we're already used to using, but we bring to the table some additional benefits, some control, some consistency that we used to have to just not be available to us or not have the, the ability to, to use every day. If you can take a variable out of the equation every single day, you have a better chance at hitting your targets. And that's what Hydrogreen does. Thank you. I Thank think you, it's well done. a very inspiring story and actually a nice, uh, I think, closing of this panel discussion. So I would like to thank uh, all of you. Um, so Abdulaziz, Abdulaziz, thank you. Bern, thank you. Tom, thank you. Thank you very much. And Jim as well. Um, and I think a nice way to actually show our appreciation to our panel members is to raise your hand as an applause. Yes, <laughs> fantastic. Yeah, whoa. It's like this mirror that goes like boom, 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 boom. <laughs> Perfect, yeah, thank you. And a very, very big thank you to our presenters of today. Uh, I think you've uh, offered a lot of food for thought um, and also a lot of inspiration. So again, raise your hand for Mr. John De Jong and Mr. Brandon Peterson. Thank you, everyone. Wonderful, wonderful. Thanks, guys. Yeah. So, oops, uh, so um, now I think we're at the almost at the end of our webinar of today, and I'm going to give the word to our president, uh, Mr. Abt van Velde, who will tell you about today's. Uh, about the upcoming uh, GDF webinar. Does that work? What? Yes, you can hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, thank you, Yvonne. Thank you, John. Thank you, Brendan. Attention to our uh, next webinar, June 16, about control of your dairy farm. It will be a very practical webinar presented by Kurt van Lenteren, head of Dairy Excel at Lely International. And future-proof farming is something we all want. Kurt will speak about how to be in control on your farm. Do you make the right decisions? How do you manage possible changes? How do you optimize your farm? How do you engage your people, your team? All these topics could will discuss with us. And you will get a registration link in your mailbox within 24 hours. Um, I would like to thank everyone to attending this GDF webinar. If you want to mo know more about GDF, please contact us. We are always interested in future oriented dairy farmers and business partners from all over the world. Uh, for the real GDF farms, GDF fans, sorry, after this webinar, we will show you a short video who will give you an impression of our fantastic GDF Congress in China last October. So finally, take care, stay healthy, and hopefully we will meet again at June 16th. Thank you all, bye. Thank you everyone. Bye.